was dark under the water, those murky waters, is teeming with wildlife out there. And uh, I expect, I'm, I can't cover them all, so please don't come up to me afterwards and say, why didn't you talk about this? Because I'm not going to cover them all, just the ones that it, I think is interesting or, or important. But, uh, of course, the channel catfish are very popular. Uh, they're good eating, and they uh, have a, a, they say they fight like a bass. And so that's a very predominant fish, it's a channel catfish. But there's lots of big catfish in this river. Blue cats and flatheads and mudhead, all these different kinds of catfish. Some of them get very, very large. In fact, here's a picture of one. Uh, that, oh, wow. <laughs> you believe that, don't you? No. Wait a minute, I got that off the internet. It must be real. <laughs> okay, maybe not. I'm a little suspicious about the next one, too. I don't know. You be the judge. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay, fish stories. Yeah. Uh, anyway, there are some big catfish. And there's a lot of carp, the different varieties of carp. I've never really acquired a taste for the carp uh, myself. But uh, there's different varieties of those carp out here. And these rascals, the Asian carp, who are not very popular. Uh, they're an invasive species. They were actually brought into this country as an experiment to clean up dirty ponds because they don't eat other fish. They're not meat eaters, but they'll eat everything else. They'll eat their vegetation, algae, goop. Yeah, they don't eat it. So they and then they escaped. Now this is down on the Mississippi River. They escaped and flourished and moved up rivers. So now they're a problem up here because they're 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 starting out other fish in the waters, and they uh, and they create a problem sometimes, well, often they're entertaining. Am I right, Brendan? Yeah. They're entertaining. <laughs> yeah, a lot of fun. They're jumping in the water because they get, they get startled by the boat motors to be jumping around. Uh, and I've had them land in a boat before, you know, the trouble is they land in a boat, they bleed all over the boat, too. Oh. <laughs> but anyway, now, this is a slow-mo, this fellow, who did, wasn't so much entertained by the results of this Asian carp jumping in the river. Uh, wait for it. That's gonna happen. Yeah, that's a pretty big fish to slap you in the face, but this guy really <laughs> took the hit pretty hard. And here it comes, and whack. Yeah, that had to hurt. That had to hurt a lot. He lost his hat, too. Yeah, he lost his hat. I built a lot of ball caps in the river, by the way. Not to get hit by Asian carp. Anyway. Now, that's a pretty ferocious looking critter there, do you think? Uh, that's an alligator gar. However, they're not ferocious. They never hurt humans. They're very gentle giants. Uh, but they are putting them back in the rivers. They're reintroducing them. They are indigenous to this river. And they're reintroducing these, these uh, alligator gar because they love eating Asian carp. So it's a natural way to try to lower the populations of the Asian carp by putting more alligator butter in the rivers where they eat them. So that's a uh, much better alternative than chemicals or anything else that we come up with so far. I love sturgeon. The sturgeons are magnificent fish. They're prehistoric. Their fossils date back over 120 million years. Now, they were around when the dinosaurs walked the earth. And they've unchanged. You ever watch the movie, uh, Jules Verne movie, 20,000 Leagues Below the Sea? You remember his submarine called the Nautilus? He designed it after this fish. It looks like it. They're just amazing fish. Uh, they are also, they're caviars, their, their eggs are fries, and people have got them for their caviar also. Uh, that's one of the reasons they've diminished a lot. But they are amazing looking fish. We still have them in the Wabash. Along with these, uh, the spoonbill or paddle, yeah, paddle fish. Uh, both, a lot of people think they're catfish, they're not catfish. You know, like they're scaleless, they kind of look like cats. They are in the sturgeon family. And they're also prehistoric, about the same time period as the other sturgeons, the general sturgeons. But they, they're just amazing looking fish, these, uh, these uh, paddle fish. Now, the freshwater mussels. I'll talk for a few minutes about that because they are so important to our waterways. Freshwater mussels have become uh, really endangered. Uh, a lot of that, 
started back in the 1920s and a lot because of the button manufacturing businesses. There were quite a few in Ontario. There was a large one down in St. Francisville, Illinois, and where they would capture these uh, the, the fish, they were easy to catch. They would just rake over the, the muscle bands with a chain, series of chains on poles. They would, hook. they would catch themselves. They would respond to that by grabbing whatever it was. And they would harvest these millions and millions of mussels and drill holes in the shells and make buttons out of them. And occasionally they'd find a pearl. And the freshwater pearls were not usually very valuable because they're not round, perfectly round. Sometimes they're kind of peanut shaped. But the, uh, the pop, what people didn't realize then, and we do know now, is that these animals are filters of the water. They clean the water. They take in dirty water and they take sit down clean water. Each one will put gallons of it a day. And so they are very important fish for helping keep the waters clean. They have now been protected in Indiana since 1991, and they are making a comeback. And more muscle beds are being found all the time, and they are helping to improve the waters. I'll tell you how important the mussels are. Uh, on the Mississippi River at uh, uh, Davenport, Iowa, they're building a new bridge, or I-74, and they built, proposed to build this bridge right where there's a huge muscle bed, giant muscle bed. They're always there. Well, they can't disturb those muscles. So right, they would need to put the bridge there. So the whole time they were dividing and building that bridge, they had divers moving the muscles. <laughs> they work on it. The next day, they go back. And that was their job full time, moving the muscles. And then once the bridge was done, they went back to their place. So they were basically undisturbed. That's how important those, those are. So, you know, and the, the pearl thing is kind of interesting because, yeah, you, you get a freshwater pearl sometimes, but they, they create these pearls because the fish will nibble on the shells. And that ear that will get inside and irritate them. It's not usually sand. And that will create a, a substance called nacre which builds up like onion skin, and that's what becomes a pearl. Now, even though the freshwater pearls are not that valuable, what the Chinese, the Japanese use it for is they buy this mother of pearl, the shells, that's mother of pearl, grind it up and inject it into the clams, creating that irritation. That's called a culture pearl. It's a result of the mother of pearl from these freshwater mussels. So the Japanese still have a market for it. However, even the shells are not allowed. In Indiana, you can't take the shells or the mussels at all anymore because they're endangered. Anyway, they're good to have in the waters. Other varieties of fish, we're getting more game fish in the river, bass, solder, uh, perch, sunfish, fish you never used to see in this river because it was too polluted. On the river, now on the river, of course, you see these things a lot. Now, I'm sure anybody that's been out here in the river has seen the cormorants. Cormorants are ducks, but they're a different kind of a duck. Uh, unlike regular ducks who have hollow bones so they can fly easily, they have solid bones, making them dive easily. They do not shed water like other ducks. And again, that's for them to dive, but they're not very good flyers. You know, they get to some spread their wings and dry out before they can fly off. And so you see a lot of them out there. The Chinese used them for fishing. They would put a ring around their neck and a, a rope or line and train them to dive and catch fish. When they catch the fish, they couldn't swallow because the ring was around their neck. They would pull the fish out, send it back down there again. But uh, anyway, there, you see a lot of them out there. They're pretty amazing. You could say they have their ducks in a row, couldn't you? Uh, <laughs> okay, forget I said that. I didn't say that. Anyway, of course, we all and everybody loves the American Eagle. We're so pleased, and I am so proud that there's so many of them now in the Wabash. None were out there when I was a kid. The, 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 the water wasn't clean enough. It wasn't, uh, nothing was right for them. But they, uh, we have so many. We run the largest concentration of eagle nests in the, in the, in the east is right here in the Wabash River, and they're growing. They're just beautiful, beautiful birds. <coughs> you see quite a few various kinds of uh, herons out here, or egrets. Uh, they're also good for navigation because when you're going along and you want to stay in the deeper waters, if you see a bunch of these, you know, like, seeing birds standing in the water is a pretty good indication of shallow. <laughs> <laughs> you want to 
gonna steer around that for sure, you know. Yeah. It's a good good navigational aid is you know. And then we have the very uh, the hawks. The hawks are good fishermen, they're fast, and their eyesight is just incredible. The great blue herons, I love these birds. They're giant birds. Uh, they spend their days alone hunting and their nights in rookeries and trees. Uh, but they don't like being disturbed. And you come up on one and they squawk and then they take off and they're just mad because you disturb them. And they usually don't let you get very close. But one day I was I was in the canoe and I was paddling down the Wabash. And there I saw in the distance this big blue heron looking the other way. Well the canoe was quiet. And so he didn't see me coming. He was looking off the other way. And I thought, oh, this would be a good time to get a picture of this great blue heron. So I stopped paddling. And I let the current tilt me toward him. And I got amazingly close to getting ready to take my picture. And suddenly this bird saw me, startled him. He got angry. He squawked and he took off flying right over the top of me. And I did get a picture, but what I discovered that day was they lightened their load. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It was awful. It was terrible. Oh, well, I had to get in the river and wash off. <laughs> All the while, thankful that I, my mouth was closed during that process. But anyway, it's, uh, yeah, I learned a lesson. Let them know I'm coming from the I have a favorite saying, I don't make the same mistake twice. I'm too busy making new ones. <laughs> was, that was one of them. And of course the turtles. You know, I love the turtles. You see a lot of variety of turtles out there on the river uh, sitting in the sun. And they don't let you get very close either. They usually jump in before you can get to them. And of course, we have a, this is a common water snake. Uh, the water snakes in the Wabash are not poisonous, uh, but they are aggressive. They are territorial. I have been chased back to the boat by them. because You still don't like getting bit by them, whether they're poisonous or not. And, uh, and so, but you see a variety of those out there. They're uh, beautiful, beautiful animals.